Welcome back to New Rockstars. This is The Big Question, the show that gives you too much information about how all the wonderful things that we thought humans had invented throughout history were actually just given to us by our extraterrestrial masters who treat us like toys in their very own dollhouse. Nothing is real. Believe nothing. Everything is Believe just nothing. data. Everything's a lie. <laughs> Everything's a lie. End of the video. <laughs> Seriously, believe nothing. Um, it's all just one big simulation. The Matrix is real. The Matrix is a documentary, honestly. Whoa. Uh, my name is MT, and I'm here today with my big question brother, off-screen producer, Brandon. What's going on, Brandon? Hello, MT. I'm so happy to be here today. I'm so glad that there's those Eternals watching out for us to make sure that we could be here in this moment. Thanks, Eternals, for keeping us safe. Seriously, there are babysitters. Like, I would be so rambunctious <laughs> if it wasn't for Icarus and mm -hmm. Cersei keeping me in line. I need I need my parents. Yeah, we would have been eaten up by those deviants long, long ago. Seriously, thank, and I'm, like, thank God super like tasty. Us. So, like, I'm Haitian, so, like, mm. Haitian food is delicious. <laughs> so, I'd be eating first. Come with that extra spice. Exactly. Some, uh... Some grill, if you're from my Haitian people out there. Some grill and some pickles. Some pickles on my head. Hit me with that big question, Brandon. <laughs> okay, MT. Uh, guys, if you haven't guessed, we're going to be talking about Eternals. It's mm. finally out in the theaters. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, go you know, see go it. Go watch it and then come back to this video. We're going to mm. have so many videos on the channel about the Eternals. It's Eternals time, baby. Yes. Um, Eternal Eternals videos. Forever. Yes. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> Forever. Um, but yeah, now that we have the Eternals, we have this like totally new perspective that we can view the MCU through, especially as it stretches across the timeline of human history, mm, right? Because right, the Eternals, right. they've been there. They've been watching us. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Angelina Jolie gave this recent interview where she talks about that there may have been moments throughout time where the Eternals played a part in the development of technology, uh, mm. whether it was helped humanity or if it helped some of the MCU heroes that we already know, uh, some of our favorite heroes, some of the movies we already saw, the Eternals might have been there. They might have been mm. helping out. We don't know. <laughs> so it leads us to today's big question. What secret technological assistance have the Eternals provided across time? Mm, this is a great question that opens up a lot of many possibilities here because as we already know, Angelina Jolie herself made the Nintendo 64. So we already know this as a fact. I'm just kidding. <laughs> she made it? I thought she made the GameCube. Now, this is a great question that opens up the door to so many possibilities. But let's begin with that comicbook.com interview that you mentioned, Brandon, because it's very important. Mm. And in it, Angelina Jolie and Sama Hayek were asked about their Eternals characters and if there were any other MCU heroes that they would be impressed to meet. And that's when Angelina kind of just reframes the whole thing and says that we can assume that the Eternals have been in the background the entire time and that they're mm -hmm. aware and know pretty much everybody. And then she says, if you watch the other ones, we've been there. The question is, are there certain things that Fastos created that you've been watching and thinking it came from something else? Was it actually Fastos or has somebody else been doing it all? So this means that there could be moments throughout time where the Eternals could have provided some assistance in the development of technology that helped humanity. And this could be both real world technology and human history, as well as moments that we've seen in the MCU. And we saw examples of this in the film. And for example, it's implied that Fastos played a role in helping humanity discover how to split the atom, for instance, which is a really big discovery. And a lot of shit yeah. went down, you know, the, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan during World War II happened because of that, which Fastos seemed not too happy about. He seemed very Yeah, upset. you could tell he, he regretted that. I mean, even the real scientists who worked on the Manhattan Project, which led to the atomic bomb, they were pretty bummed out about the final results, too. It was like the whole thing of like, we really want to split the atom. And then they did. And then they saw what they could do with it. And they were like, oh, boy, Ooh, what did we do? Big old whoopsies, Fastos. Big old whoopsies. Oh, big old whoopsies. <laughs> And we also did get that glimpse of Cersei helping the early humanity with agriculture and farming and all that stuff. And uh, I don't have a green thumb at all, so that would be a lot of help. Thank you, Cersei. You're so nice. <laughs> so this means that it's time to open up your history books. And as we go through time to try and pinpoint some key moments in humanity's development that could have had some eternal intervention. Things like mm. the Vibranium, which is this huge oh. technological discovery in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The biggest one ever. Everyone wants their that dang Vibranium rock. They, they're obsessed over a Frisbee for the longest time before they gave it to <laughs> Mr. Uh, Steve Rogers, so. Yeah, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's vibranium. No, don't do it, because uh, Wakanda don't will come after you and will stab you. That's so true. watch out, Captain Carter, because uh, <laughs> Dora Milaje is coming for that <laughs> ass, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
So yeah, it's one of the most important elements found on Earth. And legend tells us that a meteor brought vibranium to Earth when it crashed in an area of Africa that we now know as Wakanda. But could that just be just a legend? Is it possible that the Eternals created all of that vibranium and gifted it to mankind, specifically the Wakandan? What if that whole legend was like just a legend? It wasn't actually real. Like what if they made the vibranium themselves, the Eternals? It's, it's a legend that's kind of passed down. I mean, at this point, uh, in like modern history, they should be able to prove that there was a meteor that hit at some point. There would be, mm. you know, uh, some sort of crater or something. I, you know, I, I don't know how they prove meteors hit. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's ways to tell geological features that can, you know, uh, yeah. verify a theory. I mean, there's a lot mm. there because, you know, we saw in Black Panther how they're still mining it out of the earth. And it's a big mine. Uh, and it seems like they got plenty to go around. Um, <laughs> but but could it have all just been created by Fastos? Could he have just mm. made all of that vibranium? Yeah, I mean, there could have been like a, a celestial machine or some sort like a, that right. he used for a celestial purpose to create this like magical rock, this magical material that served this huge purpose. So whether vibranium did arrive via meteor or the Eternals created it, it's possible that the Eternals chose the Wakandans as the recipients of this oh. important metal. And perhaps they saw the Wakandans as the chosen people of Earth, which, you know, I would argue that they are. <laughs> they're pretty good. They're pretty, they're the right people to choose if you're going to choose some people. Oh, hell yeah. They have kept that vibranium a big old secret uh, for many mm -hmm. years. So good choice, gods. And the Wakandans certainly would have seen the Eternals as gods like everybody else did. And Fastos could have shown them how to utilize the material to their advantage with the caveat is that they keep it a secret from the rest of the world because it's just this huge like new cosmic material that the rest of the world is not prepared for because they're slowly trying to introduce advancements to society. They don't want to push everything like all at once. Right. So it would make right, sense right. for them to do that. And they could also could have been the ones to teach the Wakandans how to utilize the heart-shaped herb to cultivate the power oh. of the Black Panther. And all the future tech advancements that came from Wakanda could have been set in motion by the Eternals showing the Wakandans the secrets of Vibranium many, many years ago. Yeah, if, if you know, the ancient Wakandans come across these Eternals, right? They're going to assume mm. they're gods, especially if they're flying around shooting lasers out of their eyes and stuff. And they're like, oh boy, this is a lot of vibranium. It's not from Earth. These Earthlings are too dumb-dumb to handle this. Uh, we got to find some good ones. They they locate the local Wakandan tribe and they're like, hey, we're gods. Uh, hello. And they're like, oh. <laughs> what? We're going to show you this metal. It's pretty badass. You mm. can do a lot with it. We'll show you how to use it. But you cannot tell anybody. If you do, we're going to smite you because we're gods. I would love if, if Fastos introduced himself like, hi, I'm Fastos. And they were like, Bast? Bast? Did you say Bast? He's like, sure. Uh, Bast. You can call sure, me Bast. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Whatever. <laughs> call me whatever you want. So yeah, they show him how to use it and they've kept it secret for so long because, you know, the Eternals trusted they could tell that these were the right people to handle this technology. I, I do like the idea of the Eternals kind of using the country of Wakanda sort of like as a, um, I don't know, like sort of like a test. It's like, hey, this is oh, what would happen yeah. if we did, you know, give them technology before their time. It's like, look at this African mm. nation. They're super advanced. This is not the celestial plan. So like, we're just going to keep right, this right. nation over here as a, just a, this is what happens if we do things too early. I do like that idea. But now let's go way back to a pivotal discovery in human history, the wheel. I don't know if you've heard oh. of the wheel. I've seen a wheel or two in my time, MT. I've seen I've seen a wheel or two. Oh, yeah. Steve Jobs, uh, he announced it right before he passed. Uh, the wheel mm, changed the game. The eye wheel. But yeah, what's important here is not just the wheel itself, but the concept of fixing the wheel to an axis. Like any old caveman mm. can figure out a wheel when they see a rock rolling down a hill because like that's just gravity. Right. It's like, oh, round things go down the hill when gravity pushes it down. Great. Ooga booga. Uh, but attaching a wheel to an axle allowed more control and versatility to harness the functional benefits of a wheel. And our oldest known mm. examples of humans harnessing this tech is most likely the potter's wheel, which dates back around 4,000 years BCE in the Mesopotamia region. And this could lead to so many advancements in farming and technology, along with a greater understanding of mathematical concepts like geometry, calculus, and physics. So it makes sense that Fastos would see some humans struggling with many of their tasks, including, you know, creating clay pots to hold water and food and would be like, hey, here you go, dummies. Here's the freaking yeah. wheel on an axis. How could you not think of this? I can't even believe it. I'm going to go back to my flying spaceship, you idiots. It's basic, basic development of technology. I, I, the Eternals might have like got the ball rolling. You know, if they're on Earth and they're you're seeing the, you know, humans just being dumb, they're like, all right, just give, give them something <laughs> to get started. It's not much, but get them started on something. See what they can Seriously. do with this. All right, I got one for you now. Okay, what you got? 
Let's discuss the printing press. Oh, okay? Gutenberg, uh, eh? Yes, Johannes <laughs> Gutenberg uh, invents it in 1440 AD in mm. Mainz, Germany. Ooh. Mainz? Hey. Mainz, <laughs> Germany. They probably hate that when they throw over the like. Why should they always make fun of Mainz? <laughs> this is the name of our city. I hope Terrence Howard goes to Mainz, Germany one day and be like, I'm in Mainz, Maine. <laughs> I hope Terrence Howard goes to Mainz, Germany, and never comes back. <laughs> He's a very weird dude. Terrence Howard developed his own math. One plus one equals three. Look it up. But no, we're talking about the printing press, okay? And this invention, I mean, you probably learned about it in history class, or maybe you slept through that lesson. But this invention, it just changed how we share literature and knowledge around the world. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, it's because of this invention that we later get to like what they call the Age of Enlightenment, mm. which promoted the ideas of reason, toleration, constitutional government, personal liberty, if you're of a certain color, uh, and progress across the world. Yeah, because it is the Age of Enlightenment, which really kicks off in around 18th century Europe. It's not all enlightenment for everybody. I, I will say that. You know, we didn't get everything right. But humans were trending upward at that point. They're starting to, you know, understand things a little bit better, be a little bit nicer to each other, understand mm. the need for societies on a grander scale. There were already like printing presses when Gutenberg came around with his invention, mm. but they were like much simpler. They were, it took much longer. The printing press that Gutenberg invented was so technologically advanced mm. and could print so fast and so much uh, that it really did change the game. I could see the Eternals playing a role in helping Gutenberg come up with this idea, you know, being in the background, being like, hey, what if you, you know, connected that <laughs> to that? Uh, that, might, that might do something. <laughs> so yeah, I think... Of all the inventions of humankind, like I think the Eternals, I think they would have pushed the printing press because it was very important for educating mass groups of society really quickly. Oh, yeah. And it's not just education. It's more like it's communication as well, because as the earth grew and like, you know, humanity spread throughout the mm -hmm. world. It's just more, it's going to be harder for these different communities yes. to communicate with one, with one another and for yeah. humanity to grow as uh, as, as people. Because, like, if you're not communicating with each other, you can't grow. And this comes at, like, the end of the Dark Ages, too, what mm. they refer to as the Dark Ages. Humanity was just kind of stuck in this grind of, like, mm. science really wasn't advancing and, you know, mm. society wasn't advancing. Everyone's dying and it's just, like, a mess. So this really helped get us out of it and be like, at least we our knowledge can survive, even if us dumb, dumb humans aren't going to survive. We know that Sprite's stories of the Eternals like translates into a mythology in human history. So like, you know, the Eternals know the importance of the written word or the, the spoken word at the very least and how that can affect culture. So like, I feel like that could be a good basis for like, all right, let's get this printing press going. But hey, let's talk about germs this time around because hey, I mean, the, the printing press was viral. So let's talk about germs. Oh, <laughs> got him. Uh, I mean, got him, not enough germ talk these days. I mean, <laughs> I don't even know. No one's really talking about- Barely, barely talking about germs. We'll have to talk about germs now. Specifically, germ theory. Because there's a whole theory on germs, let me tell you. Germ theory is a good name for like your high school punk band. Oh yeah, you know? we are germ yeah. theory. Let's go. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Because you see, prior to the year 1861 AD, it was relatively unknown just where diseases came from. A lot of people mm. all the time just thought that they came out of thin air, or maybe even the devil, which my mom still thinks. Oh God, we're gonna see Mephisto appear in Ant-Man 3 in the quantum realm. <laughs> As a writing, writing a germ. In the <laughs> He's quantum. gonna be a germ. It's gonna be like, I'm, I'm tired <laughs> of being a germ. I wanna be a demon. And it wasn't until the French microbiologist Louis Pasteur invented his germ theory that we were able to understand that, that diseases come from microscopic organisms known as pathogens. And this discovery led to many medical breakthroughs and a better understanding of how diseases were controlled, treated, and prevented. And this is why mm. our milk gets pasteurized through the development of the process of pasteurization, which would have many benefits in the world of medicine as well as agriculture. And germ theory was responsible for helping humanity curb deadly epidemics like the plague, dysentery, and typhoid fever. So I think we can consider this a big moment for eternal intervention. Oh, oh, big time. I mean, they really didn't understand just like where diseases came from. Like you said, mm. they thought it could just like appear out of thin air. It goes on to change, you know, agriculture and like food production and all sorts of things uh, come from just the idea of understanding that, yeah, there's these little pathogens, these little germs 
that are causing a lot of problems. So maybe wash your hands, guys. Wash your Seriously, hands. Seriously, wash your hands. Do the alphabet song while you're washing yeah. your hands. Get all those pathogens off of there. Doctors thought it was crazy to wash their hands before surgery. I didn't see the point. It's like, why should I do that? I got some mustard I'm saving for later. Were they right. literally like getting like their nasty, like freaking lunch on people's organs? Yes, they didn't wash their hands before they would do surgeries and stuff. <laughs> Yo, why does my baby smell like a Subway sandwich right now? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great one, MT, but let's stay in the medical world real fast. Okay. And let's talk about penicillin. What's very fascinating about uh, penicillin, MT, is that it was accidentally discovered back mm. in 1928. Alexander Fleming was a Scottish biologist who made the discovery of the penicillin mold on accident when he mm. returned from a two-week vacation to find that the penicillin mold had prevented the growth of a bacteria culture. Mm. Now, some people are like, oh, he was just a bad lab tech. You know, he shouldn't have left <laughs> the mold in a, you know, he, he did a bad job. But what I think is interesting, because it was on accident and there's like these two weeks where he's away from it, maybe like an Eternal snuck in and did a little doot, 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 a little mm. magic, a little Eternal's magic to show him like, this is penicillin. It prevents the bacteria from growing. And then he comes back from vacation. He's like, oh, well, relaxed. Uh, had a great time at the beach. And he's like, ah, what is this? Boom, we got penicillin, right? And it would be a while before penicillin kind of became mainstream. Uh, but it was just the the discovery of like uh, antibiotics that were was so important because then you have like World War II come in right. the 1940s and that's when it kind of goes into mass production. But without the discovery of penicillin, we wouldn't have like the medical advances that we have today. So very important. Mm. Happened on accident. So I think uh, an Eternal might have snuck in and made that penicillin happen. Like we mentioned earlier, um, you have to think that the Eternals have been around for so long and that they did see this Black Plague just run amok and kill so many people. So like, you know, I think that, you know, Eternals like Thassos are probably like, all right, let's do a little bit more foresight into, you right. know, helping these, helping humanity fight off these micro, this micro world. So I think that, you know, Thassos will probably be like, all right, this guy seems like he's with it. This guy seems like he would accidentally find, <laughs> discover penicillin because this is what he does. Moving on, let's talk about something less Jeremy and more nerdy because in 1822 mechanical engineer Charles Babbage developed the first mechanical computer which he called a different engine. It was capable of doing some polynomial functions basically you know tabulating some ma mathematical functions used in engineering science and navigation and this machine would later become a more powerful device known as an analytical engine. And so history marches on until we get to the very device that you're watching this video on and it all started with a different engine and it was probably made thanks to good old black man fastos thank you fastos <laughs> i think the eternals could could tell the importance that like computing would make in humanity and after you get like the analytical engine it's tough to say who like invented the more modern like paper punch mm. computers because like a bunch of people were working out at the same time but they mm. all get inspired by this like analytical engine which is just doing s simple equations on a grand scale so let's get out of real human history. It's boring. We've had enough of it. Let's, let's talk about some more MCU places where the Eternals could have popped up. Mm. One place I'm thinking is maybe with the discovery of the Pym particle. Okay. Did the Eternals like somehow get involved with Hank Pym when he was like trying to discover this particle? You know, right. could, could they have infiltrated Shield? Like, got be like a low level lab tech at Shield, mm. kind of sneaking in to work with Hank Pym. And maybe that's why you know. Hank was so eager to put his name on the particle. He's like, we're going to call it Pim, <laughs> Pim Particles. I, I found it. I discovered it. And that's what we're going to call it. Okay. But, you know, many, many scientists throughout time have, like, slapped their name on something that really their, you know, lower level techs were working on. And they're like, this is mine now. Mm. I, I, I invented it. I'm looking at you, Thomas Edison. Oh, 100%. 100% was stealing stuff from his like little <laughs> lackeys being like, you work for me. This is an Edison product now. Edison was a very interesting, maniacal dude. Watch out. Watch out for Thomas Edison. But hey, speaking of all this technology, what about all that tech that old Howard Stark invented over the years? Mm. Like, were they all his ideas? Or could the Eternals have provided some inspiration at some point? Because when he developed the shield for Captain America that contained all the vibranium the United States was able to get their hands on, is it possible that Fastos provided the material to the Americans? 
Like, could they have known that Cap would play such a pivotal role in saving the world? There's also that new element that Howard Stark discovered but couldn't build in his current technology, and Tony would end up making that element in Iron Man 2. So is it possible that the Eternals provided that inspiration? Or was that 100% Howard Stark's idea? I mean, maybe when it was clear that Howard was going to go stick to making weapons, the Eternals dipped out and left him on his own because they were like, all right, we knew that he had the smarts to handle this cosmic technology, but he's clearly invested in uh, killing people, so we can't, he's not the one. So that's why he couldn't develop the new technology because he's just like, all right, maybe they're just waiting for his kid. He's like, you know what? Let's just wait for uh, good old Tony to pop out. I do love that idea that, that Fastos might have made the vibranium to make the shield because it yeah. was such a hard element to get. And Ulysses' claw wasn't around back then to help steal it out of the country, I guess. I think it does make a lot of sense for the Eternals to, to give the people outside of Wakanda, just a little bit of a, like a, a chance. It's like, here, I'm not, we're not going to give you all this cosmic rock, but we're going to give you a little bit just to see how you guys, um you know, progress with it. And they used it very well. They, I mean, they didn't make a Frisbee, but it, you know, it did help this Captain America save the world. What if they even helped Howard with like the development, like the Vita rays that they mm, use when they make Captain America, true. right? Because that was the one thing that changed the serum was the Vita rays. Uh, because before the serum wasn't working, yeah, they could have helped with that project. Maybe one of those guys in the background was secretly mm. uh, an eternal. Then when the guns went off, he's like, I'm out of here. Bye. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think that he watched him pull out the gun. He's like, oh, shit. <laughs> it's all right. Oh, shit. I got to go to the bathroom. But yeah, maybe they helped with like the Vita rays. Maybe they were very pivotal in the creation of Captain America. Like at oh, every for stage, sure. like helping him get developed and created. That is our quick look at all the possible interventions the Eternals could have made over the years. If you have your own theories, please let us know in the comment section below because we love hearing from you, our beautiful nerd baby children. Mwah! But before we continue, our merch partners at Epic Hero Shop have all kinds of cool clothing and gear inspired by your favorite properties, like a new Eternals shirt and merch inspired by WandaVision, Spider-Man, Loki, and so much more. So grab some early Christmas gifts for your nerdy loved ones or treat yourself to cool t-shirts hoodies and stickers and more all at newrockstarsmerch.com. Treat yourself. And before we dive into our bite-sized questions next, some words from the people that help us bring big question to you. People like honey. We've all shop online and we've all seen that promo code field taunt us at checkout. Well, thanks to honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. The Eternals are living in that past and it, like, they, they were like, yeah, we don't do that anymore. Maybe the, maybe the Eternals invented honey. I think so. They were tired of paying full price online. <laughs> Well, Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one to your cart. And Honey supports over 30,000 stores online from tech and gaming sites to popular fashion brands and food delivery. And when you check out at one of your favorite sites, the Honey button drops down and all you have to do is click apply coupons, wait a few seconds as Honey searches for coupons, and if it finds a working coupon, you'll see the prices drop. Recently at New Rockstar's off-screen producer, Zach used Honey to save 10 bucks on some new shoes and those shoes look even better knowing that I know that he saved $10 on them. So if you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out on some free savings. It's literally free and installs in a few seconds. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting the show. And we've never recommend something that we do not use ourselves. We seriously love Honey. It's a great product. So get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash big question. That is joinhoney.com slash big question. Fresh from San Diego, California, comes the only sunglasses brand <gasps> you're ever going to wear again for eternity. That's right, Blender's Eyewear. Here at New Rockstars, we got a pair of the Moon Dog style, and boy, do we really like them. They're sturdy and stylish and perfect to wear when carousing around town. Chase Fisher started Blender's by selling his beachy shades out of a backpack while doubling as a surf instructor on Pacific Beach. His goal was to create an adventurous, mid-priced eyewear option with the same cool factor as other leading styles. But unlike expensive big brand shades that you've probably lost or smashed in the past, Blender's are actually affordable. So you're not going to cry as much when the inevitable happens. We're not saying you're not going to sit on them, but when you do, it'll be less painful. Blender's team of in-house designers are constantly coming out with new styles, from orange polarized wraparounds, tortoise shell frames with purple lenses, to classic gold arms on black lens. And it's not just sunglasses, folks. Blender's has prescription glasses, readers, and blue lights, as well as a snow collection with goggles and accessories. Live life in forward motion with Blenders today. To score 15% off your Blenders purchase, visit BlendersEyewear.com and enter the promo code BIGQUESTIONVIP. 
That's blenderseyewear.com code BIGQUESTIONVIP for 15% off. Blenders, rocked with pride worldwide. And this episode is also brought to you by Arcane, a new really cool animated Netflix original series from the creators of League of Legends. Arcane is a nine episode, three part series that follows the story of two League of Legends champions that you know and love, Vi and Powder, as they go on a series of life changing adventures. So whether you're a longtime League of Legends player or are new to Rune Terra, you're going to enjoy the series. It has beautiful animation and action packed stories that are going to keep you at the edge of your seat. And this series has intertwining stories about other League of Legends Legends characters like Heimerdinger and Jace. So dive into the stories behind one of the most played games of all time and discover the secrets of the Piltover and its Undercity. And watch this series and prepare for the epic battle that is only just beginning. And Arcane is now streaming exclusively on Netflix, so please go check it out because it's really great. Now it is time for our bite-sized questions. Brandon, are you ready? I'm ready. Are you ready to eat? Here we go. So bite-sized. So bite-sized and accessible, delicious like a tater tot. Here we go. Brandon, how does Superman fit his cape underneath his clothes? And this is from Spoon Fiesta on Discord. Thank you, Spoon Fiesta. I like a good fork fiesta, but Spoon Fiestas are pretty good too, you know? What about a spork <laughs> fiesta? Anyways, yeah, so we all, you know, we all know S- Superman, he, he likes to pal around town as Clark Kent, and he's got his, like, suit underneath him the whole time. You it's may true. think he changes in a phone booth. That's kind of, like, apocryphal. That was more of an underdog thing. And then it's also like kind of a myth around Metropolis that he does the whole phone booth thing. Okay. He can really, he's so fast. He can change wherever he doesn't need the phone booth. It's true. Use it in the show. It's not a big deal, but he, we, you know, Superman, he's got this Rolodex full of godlike abilities from mm. flying to super speed, to heat vision, to super hypnosis. I mean, the guy's got all these crazy powers, mm. but even the smartest of us old humans has got to wonder how the man of steel keeps that billowing red cape, like tucked under his Clark Kent suit which is already pretty tight in, you know what I mean? It's pretty Seriously. Tight. Well, one thing's for sure, nobody's gonna be looking at your face. Mom. Where's where's that cape going? And he's also got those big red boots, right? Where, where are those going? Have we finally found the supersized plot hole from the last son of Krypton? <laughs> well, not so fast. Right? Because those boots were not made for walking. Those boots were made yeah, to fly. They're, they're flying boots. Um, <laughs> You may think, you oh, we caught them. We got, we got, they didn't figure this out. No, they figured it out. <laughs> the comics have an answer for us, folks. During a run of the Superboy comics back in the 1970s, they would yeah. do these features in the back called the Superboy Legend. And these would explain some of the components of Superman's backstories. Okay. You know, they did one about Crypto the Dog, one about Ma and Pa Kent. Uh, but one of these Superboy Legends features a story on the origin of the Superman costume itself. Ooh. You see, in the rocket that, carried Kal-El to Earth, there were plenty of unique and versatile Kryptonian materials. These included a red, yellow, and blue blanket. Old Pa Kent somehow figured out that these materials (laughs) had interesting properties, including being impervious to damage from pitchforks, shotgun blasts, TNT explosions. You know, uh, you had a lot of downtime on the farm. He's like, what do these blankets do? I can't blow them up. Um, his wife was like, look at these cute blankets. Shoot it. Shoot it, Martha. Shoots the blanket. So they got these blankets and they're like, oh, this, this is pretty strong material. We have this baby who's flying around and uh, might kill himself because uh, they didn't know how strong he was yet. Maybe we should make him a little costume out of these this stuff. But, you know, Ma can't, she can't just, like, cut the blankets up because, you know, they're indestructible. Yeah. But she could unravel the fabric to make, like, strings of yarn or material or just strings that she could then weave into a costume for Superboy. Again, this is like the comics in the 70s. A (laughs) lot of suspension of disbelief (laughs) on like how this works. I can't break it, but I can just unspool it and make it into something else. I can weave it it into something else, right? Um, (laughs) And and this material, because again, it's like special Kryptonian material, uh, Mm. it it would also grow with Superboy as he became a Superman. Uh, Uh, Okay. And then... Good old Pa Kent, you know, he's he's rifling around, taking apart that rocket, and he found some, like, rubberized material. They call it like that because, you know, it's alien material that's kind of like rubber. That's what they make the red boots out of and the yellow belt. Wow. Um, again, this was covered in, like, two pages on the Superboy <laughs> Legend, so we're filling in a lot of holes here. Um, but because these are, again, these are fancy Kryptonian textiles, they have some really interesting properties, like the ability to be compressed into like a very, very small size. Now, Mm. how small you might be asking yourself, well, Superman was able once to like press down his suit 
into about the size of like a piece of gum and then he kind of just like stuck it in his mouth yeah what? it's really crazy he can just kind of smash his smoot his suit down into these like tiny little sizes because i think he was like going to do like a karate class with lois lane or something <laughs> he's like he's got to change into his gi but he's like i got the suit on underneath and then he, he like presses the suit down into like a little pill size sticks it in his mouth and i think he accidentally swallowed it and he had to go to the hospital i don't know it's wait did he was he really going to a karate class i'm pretty sure that was i didn't read the whole comic but i think that was like the storyline hey hey you lose concentration to fight in your dead meat yes that's it that's Imagine being the one fighting Superman in a karate class. Like, that is yeah. so whack. That's not fair. That's not fair. <laughs> uh, this is all, this, I mean, these kind of crazy scenarios are what happens when you have to write a comic book for, like, nearly 90 years. Like, you're running yeah. out of ideas. You're for like, sure. Oh, he smashes it down. He puts it in his mouth. It's like Superman Resurrected. What do we do next? Oh, put him in a karate yeah. class. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Put him in a karate Has he taken karate yet? Has anyone checked? All right, put him in a karate class. And then, like, when the Sioux is, like, exposed to the sun, it, I guess it just grows back to normal size. I don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's, how, that's how it happened. What, what I also loved when researching this, I discovered that, because you might be wondering, okay, so he's able to just, like, kind of cram the everything underneath his suit right because it's special kryptonian yeah. material he can just kind of squish it down and it fits under so the cape is just under there he's mm. just crammed it in it's under the suit that's that's the answer but yeah. ma good old ma kent when she was making this outfit uh, and she makes the cape, she like sews a pocket into the cape so when he takes off his clark kent clothes he puts them like in a pocket <laughs> what <laughs> But they also wow. say that like he sprays material on his like some special material on all his Clark, Clark Kent clothes, so he can also kind of smash that stuff up. Like one thing described him like taking wow. the shoes and like pressing them into little wafers. I don't know, man. So the whole time you see Superman <laughs> flying around, he's got a, a pocket in his cape that has his Clark Kent his Clark Kent costume in it, which is uh, hilarious. Wow. You know, I really hope that the next Superman movie goes into this. Oh, I hope please. it's a whole yes. scene yes. where there's a mock and pocket just taking apart this spaceship. <laughs> just like a whole, like a blue collar, just like hard working family. Just take it down. Old Pocket's like, mm, maybe I can blow up this movie. I don't know. <laughs> I like to think of Man of Steel when he's just like, he's like punching, he's fighting, you know, he's. <laughs> He's, he's fighting Zod like through the city and the whole time his little outfits in his pocket. And his his cape, pocket. Just, ah, <laughs> ah, ah. What if it just like fell out and Zod's like, what the hell is that? And he's like, right. ah, it's my outfit. He's like, time out. My, my clothes time fell out. out. <laughs> I lost my clothes. He's like, all right, time out. <laughs> he just collects his clothes. He just puts his back real, in his cape. I mean, it's oh a really God. silly answer, but there's your answer. They got an answer for you. Wow. Hey man, you like you said, these Superman comics have been around for so long that it so makes long. sense that these so like silly long. explanations have come up because like they had these letter sections in comics and like people were writing in like all of these questions. So like they've had to answer all these questions over the course of like a hundred years of Superman. So yeah, thank you for that. I had no idea about that. Yeah, I didn't know either. When That's I found hilarious. out, I was like, "This is fascinating." <laughs> uh, but honestly, the karate class that did it for me. I just, That's I great. love that fact. Superman in a karate class. Oh my god! I thought Superman fighting uh, Muhammad Ali was unfair, but <laughs> that was already wow, way unfair. <laughs> but all right, Brandon. Here's your second bite-sized question, Brandon. Are there any other fictional metals in the Marvel universe besides vibranium, adamantium, and uru? And this is from our favorite. I, AJ Smith, 24, always holding it down with the questions. Thank you, I, AJ Smith. You can bet there's other fictional metals out there. <laughs> oh, boy. You can bet. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, for sure. You know, in Iron Man 2, we saw, we were talking about it earlier, but we saw Tony mm. create that new element, uh, mm. thanks to those leftover plans from Pa. Uh, mm. And he never, he never names the new element in the movie, and Jarvis is just like, you've created a new element. He never names that new element that he, like, replaces the palladium in his arc reactor. But uh, there was that comic that came out based on Fury's big week where they joked that he tried to call it Badassium. Who right. was having trouble getting the rights to that name or getting the patent through. I don't know. But yeah, so there is that metal that we, and we've seen that one in the MCU. But there, of course, in the comics, there's a ton of other like fictional metals. So I'll go oh, yeah, through a sure. few of them. There's Carbonadium, which is uh, it's basically the Soviet version of Adamantium. <laughs> Uh, and it makes up, if you know Omega Red, that badass character, it makes up the mm. coils in Omega Red. It's like a little more flexible okay. than uh, adamantium. So it, that's how it has coils instead of claws. But yeah, the Soviets, they were trying to make knockoff adamantium. That's what they got. And then there's nanominium, 
which mm. is a metallic substance with anti-magical properties. Uh, there's plandanium, uh, which is a strong metal alloy that the Space Knights armor is made out of, as well as Oh my weapons. god, I love the Space Knights, man. Oh, yeah. Yes, I'm glad you brought that up. Well, they're made of plandanium. Uh, hey. And then there's epidurium, which is a super rare metal that is used in the synthetic skin of the life model decoys. And, you know, we mentioned adamantium already. You mentioned it mm. in your question. But there's also adamantine. And ah. adamantine is the golden divine version of adamantium. And it makes up Hercules's golden mace. And it, that, yeah, like it's, it's gold instead of silver like adamantium. And it's so powerful. It's been known to re be resistant to material shifts or matter state changes. So oh, like man. those kind of crazy powerful people who can manipulate matter and mm. on a molecular level, it's been known to resist that. Like that's oh, how damn. powerful it is. Uh, so very, very strong stuff. Very cool. Um, and then there's some more mystical Marvel metals out there. You know, there's like the galactic glaze that covers the Silver Surfer's body and his board. Um, but, you know, this is a bite size. We can't get into all of them. So we'll have to save all the other metals for another day. But those are some of the other metals you can find out there in the Marvel Universe. Like literally galactic glaze sounds like a Dunkin' Donut. Uh, I know. Doesn't that sound delicious? <laughs> galactic glaze. Let me get that uh, silver surfer galactic glaze. That sounds They sell uh, that suggested. galactic glaze out of the wheat stores out here in California, man. <laughs> well, thank you, Brandon, for your always amazing, insightful answers to our big mm. bite question. Well, our small bite sized questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, now it is time for our box of scraps, Brandon. Ooh, box of scraps. Box of scraps. <laughs> Ooh, the box of scraps. The box of scraps, please. It's a box of scraps. Well, Brandon, if you were an internal, what historical event would you like to be present for, but not meddle in? Mm. So like any historical event throughout history. Yeah, that's a good uh, box of scraps question, MT, because then I don't feel the pressure to go fix some of the wrong <laughs> yeah. that happened throughout history, <laughs> which I would love to do, but I can't do it because I'm an eternal and no deviants were involved. No deviants were involved. I can't get, I can't get my hands dirty. Sorry. I think a really fun thing to see would be to go back to you know i love going to a renaissance fair but what mm. if you just went back to the renaissance you know what i mean just go and hang out oh. a little renaissance italy maybe just you know view view leonardo at work you know maybe view michelangelo michelangelo at work not talking into turtles i'm talking like the real <laughs> artist you know be like a patron of the arts to be like ah yes leonardo this helicopter mm. you've designed is quite something is a little money to go build it, you know, maybe get that <laughs> tech going along. But it'd be it'd be cool to see like the real Renaissance. I mean, it's gonna smell mm. terrible, but that's okay. Oh, for sure. I'll, I'll deal. I'll get used to that. <laughs> There'll be some good food, you know, some good entertainment. They'll be playing that lute, you know. They'll that be playing lute? the the lyre. Uh, they'll be <laughs> singing songs. It'll be maybe some joustings going on. I don't know. Who knows? The Renaissance was like four hundred years. I'll pick a good time to go during that and just <laughs> hang out and have a good time. That's a good one. Oh, man, that's a really good one. The Renaissance. Like, literally, a, so much popped off during the Renaissance. I would love to talk to, uh, what's his name? Leonardo da Vinci. I'd be like, where's, where's the blood of Jesus? I don't know where it is. <laughs> where's the da Vinci code? <laughs> I saw the movie, and Leonardo's like, what's a movie? <laughs> what's the movie? Who's a Tom Hanks? <laughs> Who's a Thomas Hank? <laughs> Sorry, I'm sorry to all our Italian viewers. I'm so sorry. I, just, I can't do Italian at all. I mean, what would I choose? I think I would choose sort of like in a similar vein. I, I would probably just hang out with a bunch of like Greek um, philosophers, honestly. Mm. Just like attend one oh, of their yes. like little seminars that they gave out in public and just be like, ooh, the wisdom. Because I'm a huge fan of just like looking at like old wisdom from the past. I'm a huge, like if you guys don't know about Stoicism, you guys should look into it. Because like Marcus mm. Aurelius, Epictetus. Um, all these like uh, famous Stoic philosophers um, really knew how to live life, in my opinion. And like they had these really interesting um, like ideas about philosophy and like the actual tenets of cognitive behavioral therapy are, are in Stoicism. So I think I would just go either back in time to the Stoic philosopher days or like the Greek, you know, we're just going to talk about philosophy, basically, because I'm just a sucker for philosophy. And then, yeah. and then MT, you'd slip up and you'd be like, well, you know, the earth goes around the sun. And they'd be like, what? what Kill, this man. <laughs> Kill, Kill this man. Kill this man. Heretic. <laughs> Heretic. Burn him. 100%. Uh, but yeah, I think that it'd be fun. I just, I just like learning about, I don't know, little like concepts and like philosophy and all that stuff. So 
that's me. That'd be cool. Um, that that like old painting of everyone sitting around talking. Yeah. Like, you know, and Socrates and stuff. It always you looks so much fun. Just be hanging out in the back of that painting, just like having a good time. <laughs> just me and my big black bald head, like. Mm. Yeah. And you could just like blow their minds. They'd be like, ah, oh, the stars, the spirits of our ancestors. And you're like, actually, they're giant balls of gas millions of miles away. And they'd be like, burn this man. <laughs> well, that is it for this episode of Big Question. I want to thank off-screen producer Brandon for joining me this episode. Please follow him at Britton Barrick on Twitter. He is an amazing man. He does a lot of amazing stuff. And so please follow him there. Follow me at Master Tamen if you want to see me tweet some really weird shit. So most importantly, follow New Rockstars wherever we are, especially on Twitter and on YouTube. And when you do on YouTube, make sure to hit that notification bell so you can get notifications every time we upload a video. And please, of course, hit up NewRockstarsMerch.com so you can get cool shirts like this so girls can talk to you um, and think that you're super cool. And if, you, <laughs> if you're not into girls, it'll be whatever, whoever you're into uh, that will think you're super cool because you are. And you I love are. you. <laughs> But That's anyway, thank cool. you guys so much for watching. Uh, we really do love you, and we'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye. Bye.